chapter uh, uh, 9 for just a moment of Genesis. Let's get back there to finish up. Chapter 8, we're going to look at the covenants and promises of God and the roadmap of history. That'll be a great time next time. But after that, the next week after that, we're going to look at the descent of man and caveman. You know, the subject of human origins has been so distorted for over a hundred years by evolutionism. All the displays in museums, all the pictures in magazines, and even most textbooks in schools have persuaded people that we have an animal ancestry. But the world believes that our animal ancestry leads back through this intermediate stages of ape-like creatures that were our ancestors. And most notably, there's this long list of these near relatives of ours, of which one you've heard of and still is in the books, the Neanderthal man. I like this article from a recent issue of a science magazine, by no means Christian nor creationist. The Nature magazine said this, the Neanderthal man was evidently a normal human, no ape, no monkey, no evolution, who was the victim of his own decision to move too far north at the wrong time in the absence of sunlight and proper vitamins caused him to stoop and slump and walk and be deformed. You know, this picture of the Neanderthal man from Nature magazine fits well with the concept of the post-flood man struggling to live in this new world. The glacial period which followed the flood was brought on by the total climactic conditions that changed by the flood. Although a global, mild, subtropical climate climate had been everywhere, I mean, the biggest coal fields in the world are in in Antarctica. Uh, Some of the most lush vegetation in the world is under Siberia today. Those, Those mammoths that we looked at a few weeks ago, those things need hundreds of pounds of lush vegetation every day to live on. And they were up by the North Pole, so there was this tropical climate all over the world, but the greenhouse effect of the world that perished was utterly changed by the flood. When the canopy of water was precipitated at the flood, the present, and this is what the scientists call it, latitudinal and continental extremes of temperature became established. Snow began to fall. Great continental ice caps developed and the glaciers pushed south. And the resulting glacial epoch persisted for centuries in the north latitudes. And that's why, at the same time, there were warmer climates and great civilizations that developed in the lower latitudes. That's why, in history, the great early civilizations fan out from the area around the ark. And the northern European civilizations are later because the recession and the receding of the glaciers had to occur before they could move north. Well, we'll see that, because only God's Word explains the brave new world of Noah and his sons. And two chapters in the Bible, Genesis 10 and 11, give the divine record of the so-called Paleolithic, Mesolithic, and Neolithic ages of archaeology. The world of Abraham was already into the so-called Bronze Age. And we know that these are all conjectural, these ages that they put up. They're just to sell museum space. And they're only based on evolutionary assumptions because even today there are primitive tribes alive and they have Paleolithic, that's Old Stone Age, tools. I mean, they're out there. Read the National Geographic. They're chronicling them. At least they tell the truth about that, not about these bird dinosaurs. They lie about that. But at least they tell the truth about the Stone Age cultures that use crude stone implements and tools at the very same time that we enjoy the electronic, cellular, digital, terabyte age that we live in. In our study of the lost world, we saw that man had a high degree of culture and technology before the flood. But after Noah and his family left the ark, they were armed only with what they had learned and retained in their minds and whatever they were able to carry on to the ark. So at the beginning of the brave new world, they were forced to make use of stone and wooden implements. And that lasted until they could finally find the veins of metallic ores they knew were out there in the rocks of the newly formed lands of the world. And I'm sure that caves were often their first resort for shelter until they could find the time and the supplies to build something else. And so the Neolithic cultures and the Paleolithic cultures of early man, when rightly interpreted, are merely a commentary on how hard it was to survive 
in those small tribes of people after the flood. Well, chapter 9, verse 20, is the next message, our fourth uh, stop in this series. And we're going to look at what happened with Noah when he got drunk, what happened with Ham when he looked with sinful intent at his father, and why did God curse Canaan? And above all that, what is going on there? What was the curse, and why did God exterminate Canaan? Chapter 10, when we go through there, we're going to look at the races, and we're going to look at the fact that the Bible clearly teaches that all present races and nations and tribes and languages have been derived from Noah's three sons and their three daughter-in-laws and a few thousand years since the flood. And the development of the present world population from this beginning is very reasonable and very conservative. You just take an analytical uh, program and program in three couples who could live five to six hundred years and who could beget children and see how big and how fast the population could mushroom. In a world, they had very little disease. They had very little problem with any type of, of great catastrophe because it was just fresh from the flood. And you'll see that it's very possible that everything could be here in 5,000 years. Finally, I want to stop with chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. And what I want to say there is, could it be that God directed that revelations about him be engraved upon the only indestructible system that the ancient world knew about, namely the starry heavens? And could it be that those groupings of stars that were familiar to the people who had no television to, to blank out their ability to think with, and they would just gaze at the stars at night, could it be that those constellations who marched month by month across the heavens and then would return again in the same uh, patterns the following year, did God present to someone that those star groups and movements could be utilized as a divine panoramic record? of the plan of salvation? And does it say that in the Bible? And here's the last verse, and we'll stop in Job 38. Okay, turn to Job. That's, go to the middle of the Bible Psalms and back up one to Job 38. And this is very interesting, verse 32. By the way, the book of Job mentions five of the twelve signs of the zodiac, the constellations. By name, Job mentions five of them. Job is the earliest book of the Bible, the, the setting of the book of Job, other than the creation account and, and the, the genealogical records, Job goes right back there, right after the flood, right after uh, Noah. He was an early descendant of Noah. And uh, so he's right back there at the beginning. And he knew five of the twelve just like that and mentions them by name. Look at verse 32 of Job 38. Can you bring out Mazaroth? That's interesting. If you have a marginal note like my Bible has, it's just a normal Bible, it says literally the constellations. That's literally the 12 of the zodiac. That's what Mazaroth means. The key biblical reference to the constellations being the signposts of God could be this verse right here. We know the word Mazaroth means the 12 signs of the zodiac and their associated constellations. And every conservative scholar that has ever commented on the book of Job and every commentary that's ever been written by an evangelical or conservative agree that that word means the zodiac. I mean, it's nice to come to a part of the Bible you don't have everybody disagreeing on. Everybody agrees that when it says, can you bring out Mazaroth? in its season. Or can you, and here's one of them, Orion, can you, can you guide the great bear with its cubs? It's one of the twelve. Who's talking, by the way? Is it one of the comforters of Job? Is it Job? Is it the devil? No. The Lord starts speaking in verse 1 of chapter 38. God names the zodiac. Well, it could be, from the context, it could be strongly implied that the bringing forth of the 12 constellations of the zodiac is something that God had ordained. Well, 
let me ask you this. Have you ever thought about the fact that God's plan for the ages has been written? We should trust him with our future. Have you ever thought about the fact that the descent of man is a warning of, of what happens with those who don't keep God in their mind? Have you ever wondered about why God cursed the sin of Canaan so heavily? Have you ever pondered the fact that the table of nations shows that the earth and our present population and the present nations and the present tribes are less than 50 centuries old? Have you ever thought about the fact that Astrology and the Zodiac were previously the signposts God put across the skies to give a revelation of his salvation 